Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome President and CEO of PTC, Jim Heppelman. Good morning. Good morning and uh, welcome to LiveWorks 2016. This event is the single largest audience that PTC has ever convened. And quite frankly, it's one of the largest audiences ever for a forum like this that's focused on Internet of Things and smart connected products. So you might ask yourself, why are there so many people? Well, I think it's because you all realize that we're in the midst of a fundamental transformation in our world and in our relationship to the things that are all around us. I think that 20 years from now, we'll all look back on this moment and realize we were part of something special. That something special has a name. It's the Internet of Things. So, We've all seen a lot of excitement, and we're probably asking the question, is it all hype? So if you think for a minute, this late scientist, Roy Amara, who was a student of technology innovation and the founder of the Institute of the Future, is well known for what's called Amara's Law, which says we tend to overestimate the effect of an important new technology in the short run and then underestimate the effect of that technology in the long run. Now, we've all seen this pattern play out many times, if you think about it. You know, going back to telephones and telecom, and then personal computers, and the internet, and then mobile devices, and social computing. These were all big ideas that just continued to snowball year after year, and really transform life as we know it now. So I think we're starting to see it happen here again. I think that Roy's words capture the essence of what's happening with the Internet of Things. There's no question that the Internet of Things is one of the biggest game-changing technology innovations of our time. I know this personally because Professor Porter from Harvard Business School and I, together with a substantial team on both sides, have spent a lot of time researching this phenomenon and talking to many of you and your companies here in the audience about what you're doing and what you're thinking about. And what we heard and what we've observed in our publications is simply amazing. There is no doubt that things are changing in a very big way. The things I'm talking about are the things that we create that we operate, that we depend on, that we entertain ourselves. They're all evolving from being relatively simple physical objects to becoming complex physical digital systems. Now there's discrete phases along the way. We start with a physical product, we add a little bit of embedded software maybe to the user interface or inside the engine or the control system. Then pretty soon we think about connecting that smart product to the internet to get a smart connected product. And then we begin to think about how that product could work with other products by sharing digital content back and forth and we get ourselves a product system. And we might think about how that product system could interact with other systems in a system of system. So everything is headed down this same exciting but slippery slope of transformation. Now for those of you in the audience who create products, and there are many of you, uh, the actual DNA of a product is now very different than it used to be. There still is a physical product out in the field, as we say, at the edge, that contains hardware and embedded software. And that product now communicates through a connectivity layer into a cloud environment. And in the cloud environment, you're going to find a database that's gathering data from many such products. You're going to want to place analytics that help you interpret that data. You're going to want to use application platforms because there are many creative uses for different roles and, and, uh, and personalities within your company. And, and you're going to want to deliver web and mobile applications to those people. 
So this type of product, the type of product we're talking about today, is part digital and it's part physical. It's part on the edge and it's part up in the cloud. Now the cloud part can be shared across many instances of the product or shared across product families and product systems or shared across systems of systems. But everything from your watch to your car to your home to your factory to the infrastructure in the city you live in is headed down this path. This concept completely changes engineering, manufacturing, operations, service, and sales and marketing processes. For all of us, it represents at the same time an opportunity, a threat, and a big challenge to adopt. Now, fundamentally, what I see happening is that the physical and digital world, which we've always thought of separately and, and placed in different compartments in our brain, these worlds are now converging into a single new reality that's physical and digital at the same time, thanks to the Internet of Things. Because of this convergence, things will never be the same. This new reality creates so many new possibilities, so many new opportunities for innovation. So much value can now be created or unlocked in our businesses. But this new reality is not a fixed concept. It's not a fixed reality. It's continuing to evolve. And it's clear to me that the way we think about Internet of Things and smart connected products will continue to change very rapidly. As a case in point I want to dive into this morning, most people think of the Internet of Things as a way to connect, monitor, uh, optimize, and automate remote products. And these are very powerful capabilities. But we at PTC think that the notion of physical digital convergence must expand to incorporate the way that humans experience products. And that's why PTC has spent so much time and energy pursuing augmented and virtual reality in the last year. So IoT, when combined with AR and VR, gives us now a convergence of physical, digital, and human experience. Now that's a big idea. And we have some amazing examples of IoT working together with AR, VR, here at LiveWorks. <clears throat> but rather than talk about it, let's show you some of the amazing examples. And uh, there's no better way to do that than to invite Terry Lewis from Caterpillar to join me here on the stage. Terry is the perfect person. Good morning, Jim. Good, good morning. Ter Terry is the perfect person to help us understand what's possible because she is driving a digital enabled transformation within Caterpillar's energy and transportation vertical. And as you'll see, Terry bought, brought a very nice uh, demonstrator along with her this morning. So uh, Terry, thanks for joining. Happy to be here. Very Great. excited. Um, can you tell us a little bit about this impressive looking piece of equipment? Well, here we've got our uh, brand new XQ35 uh, genset that's part of our rental power business. Um, and it's it, it, often you see it on a job site, just like we see in the background. Um, and a little bit more uh, opportunity to see this. You'll see it in not only in construction sites where it's powering pumps, compressors, some of the lighting units, but you'll see it at either concerts or sporting events. You know, powering. You know, if there's a tent on site, the air conditioning, heating, and air conditioning and appliances on site. So why do you feel that this uh, demonstrator is such a good example of Caterpillar's business strategy? So at CAT, we're always looking at new opportunities to add value for our customers. And within the energy and transportation uh, business or, or industry vertical, we're looking at, we went through and we listened to our dealers who uh, distribute the products. And they, in the rental business, asset utilization is all of, you know, it's fundamental. Rental is, is a financial business. So, f and also then for our customers, when they uh, rent our products, they want to make sure it can run. Um, they want it to. They want to know where it's at, and they want the whole experience of, of rental to be easy. So this uh, 
particular genset is a smart connected product that's designed to help the dealers you know, optimize their rental operations, uh, providing the feedback through the entire life cycle for rent, re-rent, um, and making sure that we optimize the whole asset management of, of the product in, in their, across their entire fleet. Okay. So then for the customers, um, they can also look at, connect remotely with the product, understand where it's at, um, know what it's being used, and whether it's ready to be used. Um, and so we're working with PTC technology to deliver a clear understanding of that through the, uh, the readiness, unique, and uh, uptime, and performance through the whole life cycle and through the whole fleet of the dealer's uh, rental gensets. Um, for the users, they've got the asset uh, information in terms of the data utilization, whether it's readiness, the capacity, um, and then the operating hours. And as you can see, this product isn't a man product. A lot of cat products have got an operator. And so we've also, working with the technology, with the smart connected product, to make sure that you can remote control and operate this genset from a mobile device. Okay, so uh, Terry's team at Caterpillar has been one of the beta customers working with us over the past few months on a major breakthrough that we announced, uh, that we're announcing here at our LiveWorks event this morning. So if I go back to January, we had this very exciting thing event, and we introduced a vision for the role of augmented reality for the enterprise, AR for the enterprise. And we previewed at the time a concept of an AR-enabled builder, server, and thing browser under the code name ThingX. But today, we're launching that technology to market as Vuforia Studio Enterprise. It's a new technology that fundamentally changes the way we experience the things in the Internet of Things. Now, Vuforia Studio is aimed at making AR for the enterprise simple and scalable. We're on a mission to democratize AR and make its use mainstream for customers like CAT. Uh, Vuforia Studio is built on our ThingWorks and Vuforia platforms, but you'll see it also leverages our Creo CAD and Windchill PLM platforms. So a bit later this morning, you're going to see exactly how this scenario was created. But for now, let's go straight to the punchline and see how this technology works when we put it into action. OK, so the first example of the augmented reality is um, looking at from an operation when a gem set gets delivered at a job site, um, oftentimes people aren't necessarily familiar with the product. So the startup procedure is, is a little bit complicated. They might have to go through the, the process. They might have to look at a manual. Um, we've all rented rental cars and go through that frustration of reading through the manual, looking for it in the glove box, and it may or may not be there. So this is where the augmented reality completely changes that, uh, that opportunity to simplify the startup procedure. And it, it turns out the process is a little bit complicated, so we're just going to go through a few steps here. So, We'll go through and we'll push the, uh, the startup. And we can see from the icons that are showing that we've got enough fuel and that the battery has got enough power to start the genset. OK, so we turn the knob and we put, set the voltage to the, the proper voltage for the application. And the battery disconnect goes on. OK. So for the next part of the startup, um, we'll look at this, and we can back up and look at it. You see also the, uh, the, the, uh, the title of the, uh, the gen set. And we, oh, OK, we see, oops, You're there's a red light going up. Here. Yep, red light is going on. And we see the air filter is, uh, is plugged. And it actually, it's gone past its uh, service hours. And so the, uh, we know that we need to change that before this rented unit is ready to go out for rent. OK, so uh, you've shown us a couple of uh, great examples here of how uh, augmented reality would be used for the end user or operator, a very sexy, sexy uh, technical documentation delivery in context uh, right there in the product. And we've seen an example of how a uh, service technician might, might uh, also be aware of the fact that there's uh, you know, a challenge with the air filter or something. Can you tell us a little bit about uh, how you might use this for a sales and marketing? type of use case? Well, first off, let's go back, we'll go back to that service technician, go through the diagnostics that help them yep. look at uh, whether it's the units ready to rent. That's a key indication in terms of being able to utilize the asset. So we've got, again, here, the, uh, all of the icons up here. We've got the fuel. He knows that. He's got the battery. 
Um, we've got a lot of different instrumentation on this product that we can look at. And then we've also got all of these other uh, maintenance uh, parameters over here. Service meter hours, we've got some of the, the, the uh, uh, charge oil temperature, we've got the sensor data. When we go into the next one in terms of the sales and marketing, you want to be ready for that one, Jim? Yeah, I am, please. This is really exciting when we're starting to look at the sales and marketing uh, uh, experience. If a customer goes out and they want to look at a, a product, they either look it up online, um, they go to the, the dealer for the looking at their physical inventory, um, and, and that physical inventory can be expensive. So what we can do now is we can take all of the incredible CAD drawings that the engineers have done to develop the product, and then we can build that into a powerful selling tool. And so to finish our demo, we're looking here at this uh, really cool life-size augmented reality of the genset. Um, and then we can not only see the, the experience of the physical, but the digital product. And so we can do some of these animations. And Matt's going to go over here. And they can actually open the doors to the genset. You can, this is, you can go in and actually look up inside the genset. This is completely impossible with a, with a, a, with a brochure or a photo. And we can see Jim right there through the, the back side <laughs> of the genset. This is, this is really, really exciting. And so this is going to really transform the whole um, sales and marketing experience. Um, okay. Uh, wow, Terry. I mean, that is uh, truly amazing and uh, inspirational work. I mean, for people in the audience, when you see demos like that, you have to agree with me that, uh, that things are changing. So, uh, Terry, thank you again for joining us and for uh, allowing us to use your work to uh, show the audience the power of the physical, All digital, right, and human reaction. So thanks again uh, as well to Caterpillar. Caterpillar is a great longtime PTC customer uh, who is a global manufacturing icon, always at the cutting edge of big technology ideas. And uh, we really appreciate that you let PTC highlight some of your big ideas here for the benefit of our, uh, for the benefit of our audience. So it's very interesting to me if we step back and consider what we just saw in the Caterpillar generator demonstration relative to the technology stack diagram that Professor Porter and I described in our publications and that I referenced earlier in this talk. Because what we see is that AR and VR adds a whole new dimension to the way that humans interact with products. It's not about apps anymore. It's about experiences. So while IoT gives us access to sensor data and controls, <clears throat> which are essentially the blue layers in this diagram, augmented and virtual reality gives us a second channel of communication, which is the green layers that represent a visual connection to what is happening at the edge. But with AR, before we show that visual data to the end user in their smart glasses or phone or tablet, we're going to augment that video to add some very important digital content into just the right places to give you the full experience that helps you to operate the product, service the product, appreciate the product in a sales and marketing scenario, and so forth. Now, it turns out that humans really prefer to communicate in two independent channels at the same time, that is sight and sound. I mean, quite frankly, it's why you're here today so that you can both see and hear. Because what you see and what you hear each contribute complementary bits of information. And you use this information to get the full picture, the full experience. You use it to process more quickly because your brain can process vision far faster than you can decode sound and, and words. And then you use it uh, really as quality control to make sure that what you see and what you hear that these two channels confirm each other. You know, you've all heard the term body language, where sometimes what somebody says doesn't match their body motions, and then you begin to question the quality, the integrity of the data you heard. What's well, the same concept now as we interact with, uh, with physical objects? So we can augment 
the actual experience <clears throat> of a user who's physically pre uh, present with the product at the edge. And we can also share that augmented video with a remote user, the expert in this scenario, who can then enjoy nearly the same visual and data experience using virtual reality. <clears throat> so this combo of uh, AR and VR, together with IoT, is a real game changer. It's so big, in fact, that Professor Porter and I have put the band back together. And we're working now on a third article to explore the business benefits of AR and VR in the enterprise. And as you can see, there's a lot to be said. And we hope to get this article published sometime this fall. <clears throat> so we've explored already IoT in combination with AR and VR. And we've seen some pretty interesting results. And along the way, I've mentioned analytics a few times, but I didn't provide much detail. So I'd like to do that now. Because it turns out that analytics is a critical element required to unleash the power of IoT and AR, VR. Much of the sensor data we get from the edge doesn't have much meaning in its raw form. In fact, some people have said that data is the new oil. That sort of implies that data is a valuable commodity that comes to us in a crude form. But like me, probably you don't have that much use for crude oil. But you might have a lot of use for the derivative products like gasoline or plastic or lubrication or, or what have you. So if data is the new oil, then analytics is the new refinery that helps us take this crude commodity, this crude data, and refine it into powerful insights that we can use throughout the business. Now, one year ago, on this stage, I announced that PTC had acquired, just acquired, an analytics company called Coldlight. And here at LiveWorks 2016, that Coldlight technology is blasting onto the scene as an offering we call ThingWorks Analytics. ThingWorks Analytics is a breakthrough in both its power and its simplicity. And so rather than talk about it, let's take another look at a great example. And uh, please join me for welcoming another PTC customer onto the stage, <clears throat> Eric Van Gemmeren from FlowServe. Eric, uh, thanks for joining us here today. Good morning, Jim. Thanks very much. It's a pleasure for being here. Yeah. So uh, Eric is the VP of R&D at uh, FlowServe. And it turns out he's become quite an expert in machine learning and, uh, and predictive analytics. So Eric's been collaborating with PTC, with National Instruments, and with HP Enterprise, ANSYS as well, to demonstrate the power of analytics to his customers. So Eric, can you tell the audience a little bit about FlowServe and describe this very interesting looking contraption <laughs> that's here with us on the stage? Thanks, Jim. I'd be happy to. For those of you who aren't familiar with FlowServe, we're probably the greatest mid-sized company you've never heard of. We're an industrial products company. We don't make a lot of products that you use in your home, but we make the industrial foundation for the products that you do use in your home. Specifically, we're the world's largest pure play flow control provider. Pumps, valves, seals, automation equipment, that kind of thing. Do a lot of business in automotive, uh, pardon me, oil and gas, um, petrochemical, and power generation are our, our biggest customers. Now, we've been in business for 225 years. And in that time, we've learned a little bit about what it really takes to keep some of these assets up and running. What we've got here today is a very simplified demonstration of the concept that we're working on with PTC and with ANSYS and NI and HPE. This is a simple, single-stage, overhung centrifugal pump using a variable frequency drive with a standard mechanical seal, a couple of ball valves that suck water out of a tank and simply return it back to the tank. Now, while this is a very synthetic illustration of the type of process that you can see, the setup is not very much different than what you would find all over power generation, uh, oil and gas, petrochemical, et cetera. And the, the fundamental concepts we're illustrating here would be the same for a simple industrial application like this as they would be for a main boiler feed water pump, for example, in a nuclear power plant, or a seawater injection system on the shores of the Persian Gulf, um, assets which wouldn't fit on this stage and cost millions of dollars each. 
In this particular case, we've got the instrument, uh, the asset instrumented with some pressure, temperature, vibration sensors, as well as flow meters to help us gather some of the operational data. Now, that's largely analog data, which passes through a national instrument's digital acquisition bus, converts it to digital, allows us to store it. And in this particular case, we're doing all of the processing on an HPE edge line device, um, which really houses all of the intelligence. That's where the artificial intelligence is running. That's also where all of the user interface originates from, um, which we'll talk about in a minute. OK, so um, can you tell us a little bit about the uh, demonstration environment that we've created to uh, show machine learning uh, at work here with this pump? Sure, right? so let's go to the user interface here. Um, and this is really where the similarity with existing solutions begins to, to end. Um, here you've got a simple schematic illustration of how the pump is plumbed into the system, and you can see all of the various operating parameters um, that generate on the screen. Now this is what something Jim was talking about earlier in his introduction, where you know, when customers get data like a delta pressure of 11.48, what do I do with that? Is that good or bad? Well, the answer is, it depends. The, the, the correct values for this pump may be, in fact, different depending on if that's water flowing through the pump, crude oil, um, naphtha, or any other product that might be used in the refinery. So simply saying that here is the expected range of values that you can see is sometimes not all that interesting. The problem which customers have is when that all of a sudden generates an alarm, in over 50% of the cases, they find that alarm is no fault found. So 50% of the maintenance trips that they're sending out to the field actually don't generate into a corrective action. So one of the first things we've done differently here through the, uh, the ThingWorks analytics is be able to build in a, a learn and a calibration feature, which for that asset, given its operation conditions, actually learns what normal is. And you can see, when we go into this learning mode, now it's watching and observing the process and, with human supervision, understands what normal looks like and what abnormal looks like so that it understands for that specific instance and as environmental conditions change. Imagine if I had this exact same pump in the exact same application on the north slopes of Alaska versus the Middle East. Totally different situation. And I can learn that on the fly. So this helps make sure that the data that we're getting is relevant for that individual. But one of the other problems we find with our customers is when they start to get alarms, they don't know what to do with it. What does it mean? So let's actually simulate one of those failure modes now. In this first failure mode that we're going to simulate, we're going to uh, emulate what happens typically when the inlet strainer gets clogged or in some way occludes the uh, inlet to the pump. So is, uh, is this is safe? I can close this valve while this uh, pump's running? <laughs> yes, you, yes, you can, Jim, but I'm going to stand right, over I'm, here. Uh, um, <laughs> So as Jim goes ahead and, uh, and, and uh, tightens down on the inlet suction, the first thing you'll start to see is that you'll start to get some anomalies that begin to occur in the discharge pressure and inlet pressure. But again, you know, there are probably five or six different reasons why that could be occurring. And a customer doesn't know, is that a problem that I actually need to do something about today? Or is this something that I can limp along until my next shutdown period and fix it when I have time? This is where the artificial intelligence built into the ThingWorks Analytics platform helps us answer that question and give them actionable advice. You see down here, the first thing it does is it tells you what the root cause is. That, hey, what you're dealing with is a cavitation problem and the impeller of the pump. And the impact is the impeller's expected lifetime has now been reduced to six days. Now, all of a sudden, the end user has actionable information which they can use to take an action. So another fun fact is we found that, on average, when a customer gets an alert from a system like this, it takes them an average of three maintenance visits to actually fix the root cause. Now, instead of taking three trips, we can give them one trip because they know exactly what the root cause is. The other problem is customers don't know, is this something I need to interrupt my process for and shut the plant down? Now remember, they only make money while that plant is operating. And the, the lost opportunity cost for a refinery can be upwards of a million dollars an hour. So do I really need to shut the plant down now to do this, or can I leave it running? Again, the power of the ThingWorks analytic platform allows us to answer that question so they can actually figure it out for themselves. Now let's go and open up the inlet side of our strainer. And one of the things we want to do is make sure that we actually solved the problem. And the actions that we took 
completely ameliorated the conditions that we want. This is where our partnership with PTC and ANSYS really begins to benefit because what we want to do is go beyond just the analytics we can provide on the data and do real-time simulation to actually let's do a computational fluid dynamics analysis of what's happening. So if we can click on the solutions button there and actually bring up our real-time CFD, the ANSYS solver engine now runs in the background and does a, a 3D analysis to tell us whether or not we solve the problem. Now, let's move on to how we get this out of the operating room. It's fine for a guy in an air-conditioned machinery control office to be able to do this, but what about that maintenance technician out on the floor? So let's show what would happen in another demonstration. Um, in this next illustration, we're going to simulate another very, very common cause of pump failure where we're actually going to misalign the pump and the, uh, and the driver unit. Now, for those of you at the front of the stage, you can kind of hear that there's been a change in the pitch of the pump. But in a refinery or process plant, nobody's ever going to hear that. So of course, back here in my machinery control room, I get my alarms, and I can see that I've got a problem, and I can see what the impact is. OK, I'm going to run into a bearing failure. So now I need to pick up the phone, and I need to call an individual who's probably wearing steel toe boots, a Nomex fire suit, hard hats and safety glasses, and works you know, three, four miles away from where I am out in the field. How do I interact with them to guide them to the right things? This is where the augmented reality once again comes in. And we can work with that individual using a smart device like an iPad or an iPhone or similar device for them to be able to walk up to the pump and be able to see what I see in an air-conditioned office out on the plant floor. Now, the first thing that you'll notice, because a lot of these pumps, and this is very, very typical, are not locally instrumented for pressure, temperature, and that's for safety reasons, operational efficiency reasons, et cetera. But through the augmented reality, through um, what we get through the Euphoria Studio, just like you saw in Caterpillar, we're now able to expose a lot of this information to the operator, to the maintainer. If you visit the booth out on the floor, you'll see that we've actually taken this one step further. We don't have the time to demonstrate it here today, but integrating solid models with it so we can provide users step-by-step -step instructions on how to physically disassemble this pump, reassemble this yeah, pump. Okay. And that brings us to the third compelling benefit from this technology is that now that we figured out what the problem is and if I have to do something about it, I've figured out exactly what the uh, corrective actions is, I can reduce the amount of time required to perform that action. And at a million dollars an hour, getting that pump back up and running can save the company millions of dollars in lost operating profits. So in summary, what this does is it keeps the plant running longer, this reduces maintenance costs, this reduces energy consumption, and improves functional safety. And we believe that in the North American process industries alone, this has cost the industry over $20 billion in foregone operating profits in 2015 alone. So this is a huge problem that now becomes a tangible solution thanks to the enablement of some of the technologies that we've been partnering yeah. with PTC, yeah. ANSYS, HPE, and NI for. All right, great, Eric. That's uh, really fantastic. Great, great, great demonstration. Great, uh, great demonstration, Reg. Thanks very much, Jim. Yeah, it's thank you. So uh, it's, a, it's really a great uh, proof point that uh, service really is the killer app for IoT. So thanks, Eric, and uh, thanks to FlowServe. My Appreciate pleasure. it. FlowServe's another longtime uh, innovative customer who's always pushing the envelope and pushing the boundaries of what's possible with technology. I think this demonstrator does a great job showing you the power of analytics coupled with IoT, coupled with augmented reality. What if you could take all of that technology and put it in a bottle? so that you could bring it with you anywhere, bring it into any factory, to any machine, to any refinery, to any oil rig. Well, that's exactly what we're doing with our edge announcement that we put out today. We are taking the technology from uh, Kepware to connect to control systems. We're integrated with national instruments to gain data from sensors. We're bringing that up into ThingWorks Analytics for machine learning and predictive analytics. We're running that, of course, all through ThingWorks and using ThingWorks as a way to build mashups for web and mobile. And we've integrated the Vuforia Studio AR VR software all into a single package. Now, the only thing we could do better than that single integrated package would be to have an integrated device to run it on. And that's where HPE has been a great partner and this HP 
E edge line server is a great example of a ruggedized industrial server class piece of hardware that you can pretty much carry with you on an airplane, walk into a factory, plug it in, turn it on, connect through Kepware, recognize the assets, turn on machine learning, make a couple of quick AR, VR type of experiences, and in hours, you can get this kind of experience going. You're going to see it in a few more of the demonstrations that we're going to do throughout the day here. So, uh, so far you've seen some incredible IoT uh, analytics and AR, VR technology. And uh, I think you've seen some interesting solution approaches where that technology has been applied to uh, operators, to service technicians, to sales and marketing use cases. But of course, PTC's uh, deepest roots are in helping companies create things. And by create things, I mean more than anything to engineer things. And here, too, we see a massive transformation underway. And the character of this transformation just might surprise you a bit. So to illustrate how big the design and engineering transformation might be, we're going to take you back to school. Well, not literally, but figuratively. And to do that, uh, over the past few weeks, we've been working with a small group of talented high school students from a local school to transform the approach they've been using to create robots for a competition run by FIRST Robotics. So if you're not familiar with FIRST Robotics, or FIRST, it's this incredible uh, STEM organization that addresses high school, middle school, even elementary uh, STEM opportunities to inspire uh, children to, be, uh, to follow careers in science and technology. And uh, PTC is a big corporate supporter uh, at the corporate financing level, but also a huge supporter in the field where our employees act as volunteers and coaches and mentors for the team. So let's take a quick uh, look at a short video describing what FIRST is to give some context to the demonstrations we're going to show you. FIRST Robotics Competition is a fun, challenging, inspiring science and technology program for kids grades 9 through 12. It's one in a progression of four programs that make up FIRST, an international organization founded by Dean Kamen, designed to foster 21st century life skills and spark kids' interest in science, technology, engineering, and math, so they become future leaders in these fields. In the FIRST Robotics Competition, teams of high schoolers are given just six weeks to design, build, and program a robot capable of playing a challenging field game against other robots. But it's way more than robots. It's about learning new skills, working as a team, practicing respect, making new friends, finding out what you can do, and having fun. Great. So uh, please uh, join me in uh, welcoming to the stage here PTC's uh, product manager and a first team mentor and coach, uh, Scott Morris. So Scott, thanks, uh, thanks for joining us. Thank you. So hopefully the video helped us to understand a little bit about what FIRST is all about. But Scott, can you explain what it's like to actually be a mentor and a coach for a FIRST Robotics team? Yeah, it's a, it's a truly rewarding experience um, to volunteer and get in there and work with the kids. Um, I get a lot of enjoyment out of helping them design, fabricate, build, do the wiring, and get their competition robot ready for the new season. First rolls out a new challenge every year. With a new set of rules and guidelines, the students organize into teams, and they start to work on the challenge. And in the video you saw, they only have six weeks to get this done. It's a pretty tight timeline to get all that work done, especially when they're busy with schoolwork and homework. I'm sure you're all familiar with the same example. Another unique aspect of the challenge is that everyone gets the same kit of parts. It includes a set of mechanical components, electrical components, a communication kit, allowing them to develop software to remotely and autonomously control their robot. Teams are faced with a true design and engineering challenge. For most of them, it's a totally chaotic process. PTC brought my team in to show them a new way to approach the challenge. They've built competitive robots for a few years now, but we asked them to take a fresh look at their process, and we introduced them to agile engineering. The students were organized into a single scrum team with multiple disciplines, mechanical, electrical, and software, all led by a scrum master. 
The team's product owner organized the required work into a backlog of stories, and the team worked together to break down those stories into a set of associated tasks. Scrum Master now hosts a sprint planning session to determine which work items can be completed by the team to produce the first product increment. The team starts working on the prioritized tasks in Sprint 1 by assembling the mechanical chassis, fabricating the electronics board, positioning the components, and writing the first iteration of the control code. Agile creates a structured framework for the team to work from, allowing them to focus on the most important items and ensure each team completes their tasks. At the end of the sprint, the Scrum Master will host a sprint review, and that's to determine the state of all the tasks. And as you can see in the video, these updates are completed easily using the task board. This brings us to the first iteration of the minimally viable product. We're not driving yet, but the team now plans Sprint 2 and starts working on tasks to get them to their second product iteration, which is planned to be a fully functional drive base. The Scrum Master planned a critical design review at the end of Sprint 2 to determine how viable their current product iteration is. Unfortunately, the eight-wheel or the six-wheel drive base is not a success. The team receives guidance from their product owner to convert the drive base to an eight-wheel design using a standard kit. These new stories and tasks are easily added to the task board to plan for sprint number three. Okay, so the, uh, the team wants to try out a new design approach, and a uh, typical step in an agile process would be to have a design review using a prototype. And of course, prototypes are easy in the software world, but they're a lot harder to do in the physical world. So what if we could use augmented reality as part of the design review process, as a way to have regular check-ins uh, with the customer during these critical design reviews and at the end of each sprint? So it turns out you can do that sort of thing uh, pretty easily and pretty inexpensively using tools like this uh, Google Cardboard into which I uh, inserted my uh, smartphone and uh, using a smartphone and Vuforia Studio. So um, I put my phone in here, running the uh, cardboard version of the Vuforia Studio Viewer, and uh, I'm going to take a look at the design. Now I'm going to ask uh, Scott to show you on an iPad what I see, because it's a little hard to project this. And we're going to augment the actual design onto this physical obstacle that's part of the design challenge, or part of the uh, contest. And what I see here is that, obviously, there's a problem with the six-wheel design because it doesn't have enough wheel contact at all points, so it's easy to get stuck uh, where the wheels are spinning in the air. But if I switch to the eight-wheel content and uh, augment the eight-wheel version onto this same obstacle, what I see is that there's always multiple wheels that have traction and uh, contact with the, uh, with the obstacle. So I don't know about you, but I kind of think the eight-wheel design is going to work pretty well to cross this, uh, this physical object. So uh, tell you what, uh, why don't we uh, invite the team out here. So joining me here uh, on the stage is uh, Scott Young and, uh, and uh, Summer uh, Thurlow from uh, Team 4909, which is the Billerica Bionics. Uh, Summer's a senior and uh, has been accepted at Worcester Polytechnic for a, uh, for a chemical engineering program. Congratulations on that. Thank you. Summer is uh, going to have to leave here shortly after the presentation this morning because she's graduating today. Yes. And uh, I want to... Uh, I want to congratulate her, but while we're bringing the laptop up, Summer, can you share a little bit about um, the process of using Agile to do a robot design versus the uh, previous uh, wow. times that you did a similar task using more conventional uh, types of processes? Okay, so I've been on the first team for two years, and usually we wait until really late in the process to put all the parts of the robot together. And so nothing usually works out the way that we plan, so then we have to redo everything anyways. Welcome to my world. Yeah. And 
So as, um, actually with that, la one year we had to miss our whole school vacation to fix all of our flaws. Oh no. So um, with Agile, it's a lot faster and we found a problem in our design a lot faster than we would have without it. So it's really easy to use and it's very helpful. Yeah, yes. okay, great. Yes. All right, how's it looking? Yeah, what do you think? Yeah, more okay. More I, I, I think what we're going to do, just for the sake of time so we don't end up waiting too long, um, this, uh, this demonstrator will be available. I'm going to give you that. This demonstrator will be available uh, in, the, uh, in the booth out there, and you'll be able to see that, in fact, uh, the eight wheel design does very successfully uh, navigate the, uh, navigate the uh, obstacle here that's part of the actual uh, contest. So um, I want to I wanna say uh, thank you to Summer and to uh, Scott and Scott for joining us here this morning and uh, sharing your story and so forth. And I promise the robot will work when you, uh, when you catch it out in the, uh, in the uh, expo center behind us here. OK, so All right. <clears throat> so if you're sitting in the audience, you might be thinking that either this doesn't apply to you or that an agile process is too complicated. But I'm going to say, just take stock for a minute of what happened. A team of high school students with no engineering degrees or background used agile engineering techniques across the mechanical and electrical and software disciplines to create a smart connected product that could solve a very specific type of problem very, very quickly. Now, I would say we all know that at some point in time, these kids are going to uh, replace all of us. That's just a natural progression of time. But I'm worried it might happen faster than we're thinking if we don't all take this as a little bit of a wake up call. So uh, I, I recommend that you go check this out this morning. And, uh, and I also want to say in closing, thanks to team uh, 5431 from uh, Plano, Texas, who's also in the audience, who uh, came up with Eric from uh, FlowServe. <clears throat> You're going to hear a lot more about Agile engineering uh, a little bit later on today. But I want to say that it should be clear by now that the IoT and AR, VR, and analytics are game-changing technologies that will transform the way we work, uh, the way we live, and the way we interact with everything around us. And at PTC, we worked with hundreds and thousands of companies around the world, and we see that big changes are starting to happen because of these technologies. We see innovations taking shape. We see new forms of value uh, being created. And this type of technology is right in the center of all of it. So I think, sort of in closing here, our industry is at a time of great change. And the company that I lead has been going through a period of great change, which many of you have observed. And PTC is in a very unique position. We are one of the very few, perhaps the only technology company that has a foot in both the digital and the physical world. For 30 years, we've been building software that helps companies create and manage the digital information related to the products or the things in the Internet of Things. This is digital information re uh, ranging from 3D designs modeled in our CreoCAD software to uh, digital configurations and bills of material and uh, manufacturing information in our PLM system, to the software and systems engineering processes and content in our integrity ALM suite, to the service plans and service procedures for those digital products in our SLM suite. We've been well ahead of our peers in understanding the importance of software and service in the world of digital products. But we were the first, the pioneer, to understand that IoT is really just the fundamentally the next generation of, uh, of PLM. So in the last three years, we've invested many hundreds of millions of dollars to expand our technology portfolio to support engagement with the physical world like helping companies connect 
physical things to the network with technologies like Exceda and Kepware to develop highly automated machine learning and predictive analytics like you saw with the pump using cold light, which of course, as I mentioned, we've rebranded as ThingWorks Analytics. And we have developed and put together this incredible way to combine all these different technologies into applications very, very quickly for web and for mobile use using ThingWorks. And on top of that, we have invented the idea that the human dimension really comes into play when you add augmented and virtual reality and create the type of experiences you've seen both with the pump and, and in a more impressive fashion with the Caterpillar generator using Vuforia and now our new Vuforia studio technology. So we know because we've seen and you've heard this morning that tremendous value will be created at this confluence of physical and digital as these technologies come together and give us these new possibilities. So with a foot squarely in each world, we think that PTC is very uniquely positioned to become the brand that means physical, digital convergence. So we wanted to send a signal out to the world to take a fresh look at PTC. We're not the company that you maybe thought we were a few years ago. So in order to do that, we've rebranded the company with this new logo that you've seen a few times already today which is an abstraction of the letters P for physical and D for digital in the yin-yang configuration. This logo really represents a deep conviction on our part that physical digital convergence is the place where incredible value will be unlocked when these technologies come together and we blur the lines between the two. So yes, in closing, there's a lot of hype out there around IoT. But given what you've seen this morning and what you're going to see throughout this LiveWorks event, I hope you'll see that we really are on to something big. At PTC, we are opening up the offense on innovation. We are really going places. We're uh, setting the standard. And by being here at LiveWorks, you're part of it, part of something special. And we hope you'll help us to create that future because it's a journey that we're all on here together. So thank you very much for your time, and enjoy the rest of the show.